Hello everyone, this is uh, Emil from Greetings from North Korea. Pozdro Skarel de. Uh, uh, help. Uh, today my guest uh, is uh, Chad O'Carroll, founder of nknews.org. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, meet him for the first time and thank you very much Chad for accepting my invitation on such short notice. I know you're very busy right now. Um, I've Think you're now in Seoul, right? You're on a, yeah, yeah. On a conference. In Seoul. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for joining me here uh, in my show, and uh, tell us uh, what are you doing in, in Seoul right now? Well, first of all, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, so I'm here in Seoul right now for a, a 10-day conference, which is being organised by South Korea's. Uh, Ministry for Unification, they've invited 20 uh, supposed young experts to, uh, to Seoul to talk about unification issues, to meet defectors, uh, to visit the DMZ, um, and really just get an overview of how the Park Geun-hye government is uh, pursuing unification at the moment. So. Uh, we'll be here for, I think, another four or five days. There's a, a mini conference halfway through where there'll be uh, presentations and you know, panels and so on. Um, and that's about it. And then I'll be st sticking around in South Korea for another two weeks or so, just working from, um, from uh, Seoul and uh, doing meetings and such. So, yep, that's what I'm here for. Well, that sounds very exciting. I uh, hope you have a good time in Seoul. And it's going to be a pretty interesting uh, conference, I guess. Uh, I also heard that there is a Polish specialist expert from Poland, right? Nicholas yeah. Levy. Say hi to him for, from me. Okay. He was uh, also my guest uh, on Google Hangout a few, few months ago. Mm -hmm. And um, well, uh, you're a founder of the biggest North Korea website that specializes in North Korea and the world. So uh, I guess you can say that you're an expert in North Korea. And it's a pleasure to talk you, to you about it. Sure. And uh, tell me, what made you to create your own website about North Korea? I've read somewhere that you went for a trip to North Korea and that kind of changed everything. Yes, in 2009, I was doing a master's in King's College London. And I was asked to do a presentation about North Korea in Iran. One Sunday afternoon, it was raining and I was a bit bored and I decided to, you know, watch some YouTube documentaries about North Korea in advance of preparing for the, the presentation. And I vividly remember watching the Vice Guide to North Korea and finding it really interesting. Um, and I just was shocked that a country like this could exist in between China and Japan and South Korea of the world's biggest economies um so you know i, I had a job at the time uh, while doing my master's which meant i had some some decent salary coming in so i thought why not plan a trip to north korea and after my uh, summer semester begun i went to north korea with a couple of friends and really had a very interesting trip uh we we knew from the vice guides that we wanted to get out of Pyongyang and see more than the, the chain uh, the vice journalist looked at, which was mainly just Pyongyang and DMZ. So we went off to, to Wonsan, we went to Nampo, uh, down, down to DMZ like a lot of people. But it was really those trips out of the capital that I found the most interesting. And when I got back from North Korea, I realized that you know sit reading the news or, or watching news about North Korea at the time it was always very much this you know starving population living under this despotic uh, leadership and while that is true in certain areas and certainly in certain times of history the North Korea you you see on a, on one of these tours is not it doesn't quite fit into that narrative um, and I know that a lot of people who criticize those who visit North Korea will say well you only saw what they want you to see but um, 
I don't believe it's possible to stage manage a country in, you know, some of the, the major cities in countryside areas. And yeah, I, I totally agree with you and I totally yeah. understand what you mean. I also, when I went for a trip, I went in 2011, I kind of felt that this North Korean I'm visiting is kind of different from the image, the stereotypes mm. from the media, right? Right. It was a totally different experience. Uh, yeah. I know, of course, what's going on in North Korea, right? I'm not denying anything. It's just the way the media show North Korea is like very, you know, stereotypical. You know, there's always the same things, always the same topics, like let's, you know, rocket launches, right. prison camps, uh, atomic bombs. So that was uh, the reason uh, that you wanted to create something uh, of your own, right? Yeah, it was, you know, you really only had a black and white image. And while nuclear tests do exist, concentration camps do exist, there's also a whole gray area in between. And a number of people who are, uh, in some cases, thriving within the system. And that was really not being uh, picked up in the media at the time. It has got a lot better. Uh, uh, journalists have started to cover the country in a in a more nuanced way but certainly back then it wasn't like that the other thing was that after that trip i wanted to keep up with uh news on north korea just for my own personal interest and i found it really difficult because there were several websites nk econ watch daily nk leadership watch and to to check them all every morning or every afternoon was really a lot of work you had to paste in so many different URLs. So the original genesis of NK News was to aggregate everything into one place and categorize it uh, and really make it easy for people working on a subject to find links to interesting stories. Uh, so we started off mainly as, ag as an aggregation platform and then added unique stories and reporting into it as, as things evolved. And, Today, I, I think we're still uh, reflecting the same kind of dynamics that made me set the website up in 2010, which was to try and pursue an impartial style of reporting on North Korea and to uh, to not follow any agenda. You know, we're not we're not here to promote democracy or or human rights or anything like that. It's just to report the facts, report the stories, and sometimes there are stories that touch on those issues. But that's not the overarching agenda or, um, you know, vision for for why we're doing this job. Right. You you've been covering North Korea for like five years now, right? Uh, I'm correct. Yes, five, five years. years right yeah. Now. So can you tell us what are the biggest problems when you're trying to report on North Korea? What are the main issues with writing about North Korea? Well, the most obvious one is not being in the country. You know, we we are we don't have an office there. We would very much like to be able to freely report from inside North Korea, but that's not possible at, at this time. So it means if you're covering North Korea, you have to be a lot more creative as a journalist than if you're covering other countries or topics. You have to really make the most of things like Google Earth, um, you have to cultivate networks of sources that are living and working inside the country to speak to defectors who are, are going in, you know, who have come out recently uh, or who might have contacts inside the country. And you also have to develop a very sharp analytic eye so that if you're looking at pictures that KCNA or Northern Shinmun are publishing, Sometimes if you look closely enough, you can see clues for other stories that you might be working on and things in the background. Um, th those kind of things have given us some really big stories in the past. Um, but yeah, the biggest challenge is definitely just not, not having access. And um, I wish it were different because some days it does get challenging uh, reporting in this, in this style. Recently, you've uh, uh, run a very successful campaign on Kickstarter to uh, to report from the border of China and North Korea. Uh, by the way, thanks for the T-shirt. Right. <laughs> You're welcome. 
So uh, when can we uh, see the first uh, reports from from the project? Yeah, we've got um, we've got two journalists now that are uh, lining up their visits, and uh, we I think we're going to have them visiting in the next few months. I don't want to be too specific because yeah. we uh, there are some concerns with reporting from this area. Um, but yeah, just um, just give it a. a you know, two, three more months, we should, we should start public. All right, looking forward to that. Um, well, I wanted to ask you, uh, oh, I think Chad is gone offline. Let's uh, wait for him. Maybe his Wi-Fi in the hotel uh, went down. He said that his Wi-Fi isn't so good at the hotel. On the contrary, from, from what you would think about South Korea, uh, Wi-Fi doesn't really work so quickly as uh, it's supposed to be. So I think Chad has some technical problems right now. Oh, he's coming back. And he's oh, back. Hi. Yeah, Sorry. no problem. I was just saying that you could have some Wi-Fi problems as you're in a hotel. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I was just saying um, we can't be too specific with when, the people, when people are going, but um, we should have stories two or three months so yeah i'm really looking forward to that it's uh, gonna be very interesting like the look you know from china on north korea is a very fascinating subject when i was in china for one year as a student i would ask chinese people about north korea and they would ask me why you want to go there are you crazy I'm like there's nothing there i'm like yeah but still fascinating yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see uh, North Korea from the Chinese border. Yeah, really looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> I was just saying that uh, when I was in China, uh, I would ask uh, uh, my Chinese friends about North Korea, and they didn't, they didn't, didn't really know anything about this country, and they were not very interested in going there as well. Mm hmm yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely interesting perspectives from from Chinese at the moment, and one of the things that we're going to do um, just on the side of this project is do some pretty in depth interviews with Chinese experts on North Korea because you don't we don't I don't think we often hear we I don't think we hear their voices enough and. I don't think we hear them at all. I've never heard about any Chinese North Korea expert speaking anywhere. Just... Yeah, but there are several. We, you know, we got a list today of 20 that we're going to approach to do uh, some opinion driven interviews with. And uh, uh, we've done we've done one sort of five expert interview before with, with Chinese experts, admittedly not all were Chinese, but yeah, we'd like to try and showcase some of their views a bit more. How does their point of view, like on North Korea, is different from like our perspective from the West? Well, I would say from from the the little I've the few interviews that we've done with people in China, the the sort of unfortunate thing is that those who go on record don't really put their neck out. Uh, they I think there's some fear about what can be said because you got to remember some of these experts are, are still visiting North Korea quite often, and there is, I think, um, a fear that if, if you say the wrong thing, you can lose your access to to visit North Korea. And so some of the experts are reticent to say too much. Um, and the other thing is people also I don't think they want to uh, stick their neck out too much from what the government's position is either. And right now, China's relations with North Korea are not exactly brilliant. Um, so the last time we did something like this, we we actually had quite universal views from the Chinese experts, which basically all said that Beijing had been very upset by the third nuclear test in 2013 and, and that relations were really at an all-time low as a result of that. Um, but yeah, the, the unfortunate thing is that even though the, the relations are 
supposedly getting worse. There's something that I don't really understand that's happening as a result of this, which is along the Chinese border where we want to do this reporting, things are getting a lot tighter from a security perspective. The border uh, is being, uh, there's a fence that's being sort of put up along large portions of the, the border. Um, some reports say it's electrified, others just say it's a lot bigger than it used to be and, it, and in other areas it just exists where there used to be none. Uh, and then there's been a lot more, uh, a lot more crackdowns on defectors in the in that area, and a lot more arrests. And actually, a lot of North Korean, you've probably seen there've been stories with North Korean soldiers who've been uh, sort of going AWOL in those kind of areas. And the confusing thing is that all of the security seems to be getting tighter at a time when relations are are not so good and you wonder why does Beijing suddenly care about securing this border when for decades it's been pretty porous and people have been able to go in and out quite easily um, and that presents problems for our own borderlands reporting trip. We did originally think about sending one person for an extended period and um, we, we don't feel comfortable doing that now. We think it's going to be too risky to have one person working for that long so um, we're, we're looking at other ways to do it with more more journalists, basically. Going in and out. Yeah, we'll see how that turns out. I hope the guys uh, will come back safe and sound from China. Mm -hmm. um, let me tell you something about uh, Japanese experts, because actually we don't hear about experts from Japan as well. Um, for the past one year, I've been uh, going around here the uh, North Korea uh, watchers uh, community, and I've met uh, some of these uh, experts uh, like Miyatsuka Sensei, who has uh, his uh, like uh, Korea Research Institute, and um, there's actually quite a lot going on. There are conferences about North Korea. Uh, of course, the main issue is the abduction issue, right? A lot right. being said about that, and the abduction issues of the Japanese uh, nationals in the 70s and 80s is probably the biggest obstacle between like engaging normal relations between Japan and uh, North Korea. Um, mm -hmm. And could you tell me, uh, do you know anything about like, could you tell me how is this issue of abductions like reported in the West? Uh, does it appear in the media when talking about Japan and North Korea? Japan is uh, a very important piece in this puzzle of international relationships here in uh, East Asia. So how about that? Yeah, there is quite a lot of reporting on this issue. Um, you know, Japan Times, Asahi Shimbun, those kind of newspapers, we get English service on fairly regularly and Japanese media also tends to translate the, the best of the North Korea stuff. And so if there are developments between uh, Tokyo and Pyongyang, they, we often hear about them quite quickly. Um, we Last year, we had a great Japanese journalist working for NK News called Kosuke Takahashi. Uh, he's now the managing editor of uh, the Huffington Post in Tokyo. But he used to be covering the issue very closely for us, which meant for several months, we actually had a lot more coverage on this topic on NK News than other other specialist media, I would say, that work, work in this field. Uh, unfortunately, CK is no longer with us, but we do still try and cover this subject uh, very closely. In fact, if you go on our homepage right now, the main story is about Japan and North Korea. Uh, as it happens today, you probably heard there was uh, Tokyo admitted to um, uh, a case in uh, the past where Japan, uh, Koreans were working on some of the UNESCO sites. Um, and yeah, that, that was quite interesting. But yeah, the abduct abductee issue gets a fair bit of traction. And um, we've even had meetings uh, last year with some of the Japanese government uh, on this very issue to sort of discuss how it's not that you know Japanese uh, are, 
I have a feeling that a lot of Japanese actually don't really um, care about Japan. They're like not very interested. You know, they're kind of like scared of Japan. Uh, the subject of you know the abductions. It's such a long case. So like it's a lot of, like I left 13 years now from the moment that it was like officially announced by Kim Jong Il. And I think a lot of Japanese are kind of like tired. They don't really care. Of course, there's a, a lot, bunch of people who are actually involved in and. Uh, they do really care about this issue, but not everyone, I kind of think. And and even though uh, this issue is getting like, you know, older and older, there is still no, like, we can't see any kind of like uh, resolve that it's going to be resolved anytime soon. Like North Korea says that they already told Japan everything and Japan says that North Korea didn't say anything. So it's kind of like, you know, dead circle. And, no one's doing anything. Yeah, it's very difficult. Actually, uh, Mr. Takahashi, he wrote a piece for us last year just as the reinvestigation process had begun. And he basically said, the ho he described the whole thing as a farce. He said, there is no way this is going to ever be resolved. And he said some things which I find it hard to disagree with. For example, that it is impossible that the North Koreans do not know where these individuals are. This is a country where the foreign, the, the handful of foreigners that do exist are under uh, a lot of special monitoring and uh, control. And the, the idea that, they, that the North Koreans don't know where they are, is, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I think he made some good points in it. The other is that some of these some of these abductees are have been working too much with the security services in North Korea that if they were to be then released and sent back to Tokyo, that there would be a potentially large uh, sharing of uh, intelligence with the, the Japanese that you can see the North Koreans wouldn't be too keen to, to do. Um, and yeah, I, I can't see how it's going to be resolved anytime soon. But you know, they're now a year, it's a year with nothing. And uh, I think it's going to be hard for the Japanese government to resist. Um, Japan like, said that they're going to um, resume the sanctions on North Korea. So I guess uh, the negotiations didn't go really well. Uh, there is no, there are no results from the North Korean side. What That's what the Japanese side is saying. So I don't think we're going to see a, a resolution to this issue anytime right. soon, unfortunately. Yes. Uh, back a few years ago, there was even a direct flight from Tokyo to Pyongyang. Uh, there was a ferry going to Wonsan from Niigata, I think. Now, if you go to Wonsan, you can see that ferry. A beautiful right. ship, very beautiful ship. Unfortunately, it's stuck in North Korea right now. It's not going anywhere. Um, it, it's, a, it's a pity. And it's and it's basically it comes down to this uh, abductions issues, right? Uh, if it wasn't for that, uh, Japan could give some aid to North Korea. And they would resume trade, and uh, maybe even like direct flights, and maybe more tourists would even go to to North Korea. Right now, there's only a hundred people, only a hundred hundred Japanese goes to North Korea every year. Yeah, yeah, very low. If you compare that to 6,000 Westerners and 100,000 Chinese, that's not much. Yeah, well, we, we actually did a story last week, uh, a few weeks ago, which showed that actually last year, only about 3,500 Westerners went. So it went down quite dramatically. Yeah, that was because, probably because of the uh, Ebola, right? Yeah, yep. Ebola and also um, there was, what was the other issue? Ebola and we, well, we actually so th this six thousand figure up to now has just been guesswork by um, people that work within the, the tour industry. But what we did was uh, um, anonymous survey with all of the, the companies and asked them to share their numbers anonymously with us, and then we used that to get a very precise uh, um, figure on how many went. And we also asked the, the tour companies why they thought the number was going down. And obviously, uh, Ebola was one thing. But 
couple of agencies, two or three agencies, they've said that there's increased fear of arbitrary arrest amongst foreigners, especially Americans, and that the arrest of all these, you know, people uh, in the last year or two has really uh, put put some people into uh, into fearing, you know, going to North Korea. So. It's it's interesting that that's that's also been in effect. But we'll go to the uh, tourism uh, in a minute, okay? Because that's a very interesting topic, and I always ask about it. I'm very fascinated with uh, tourism in North Korea. That's actually the main topic of my blog as well, uh, here in Japan and Poland. Uh, like for example, in Japan, I try to like show to the Japanese people uh, that North Korea, well, even though the relationships between these countries are is not you know it's not very good you know but still it's their neighboring country and it's you know it's good to know a little bit about it and it's actually safe even for Japanese to go there so I'm trying to show them you know to show Japanese on my blog that it is possible to go to North Korea and it is uh, worth studying North Korea and learning more about North Korea especially when you think that in Japan there's a huge community of North Koreans living, right? And I think not many Westerners even realize that. When I posted my video about a North Korean school in Tokyo uh, last week, a lot of people asked me, like, why there is a North Korean school in Tokyo? Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, I mean, the Chongryon community is fascinating. And uh, we've been, you know, always following it uh, from, from the get-go, really. Um, there's been a few good stories in in sort of high profile western media about uh the chongyun stuff and um yeah it's it's interesting actually um you know i as far as i understood it back in the mid 90s um probably just before the famine the number of uh koreans coming back from japan was was really quite significant and there was i think the estimation the estimation was so several tens of millions of dollars of, of money was being sent back every every year to North Korean family members. And you think about the kind of transformative effect that, that could have had because a lot of human rights groups in Korea and America right now, they talk a lot about the, the impact of information sharing and how that happens often through defector channels. Well, the Chongryon... Uh, network, if you will, exceeded that by a significant, significant amount in the uh, in the 90s, and there was a lot, you know, arguably a lot more information going back to North Korea through that network than there is today, with the um, you know only 20 28,000 defectors here in South Korea. So it's uh, it's something I think it's unfortunate that the the Chongyon connection with North Korea has been impacted so much in the last. Uh, 10, 15 years because if that if that communication between family members in Japan and in North Korea was strengthened, I think it would, would really help with information freedom inside uh, DPRK. Yeah, but still, Chonryon is a pretty strong organization here in Japan. Uh, there are schools, uh, there is a university, and they're pretty active still. However, like in the Western media, when we hear about Chonron, it's usually in the negative aspect, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, last Matsutake mushrooms, right? Yes. The incident. So you don't really get a lot of coverage uh, on like the North Korean community here in Japan, uh, which is like kind of like objective that shows that they're not only like uh, doing some criminal activities, that's not the case. Actually, I've talked to uh, one of my friends who deals quite a lot with Chonyeon, and he says that Chonyeon, they don't really do anything illegal right now, basically. You know, it's, it's a, you know, a thing of the past. Yeah, yeah. They, they're still, there's still a lot of prejudice in Japan, though, against ethnic Koreans from North Korea, right? That is right. That is right. Uh, a lot of North Koreans, uh, I think, in Japan, kind of face some kind of like discrimination from Japanese. Uh, a lot of Japanese are, especially because of the abductions issues. I think they might be afraid of them, suspicious. Like, what are you doing in Japan? 
you know, uh, why are you helping out Kim Jong Il? Kind of, kind right. of thing. Right. And there's also, but I'm not sure about uh, the scope of this problem, but there's a lot of kind of like internet, like right wing racism, hate speech, mm. where you can find, like even on Twitter, you can find accounts. You know, the name of the account, account, Twitter account, could be "I hate North Korea." I hate North Koreans yeah. in Japan, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard, I've heard. There's, there's uh, also the government has removed some of the, the support for the, the education system amongst the Chongyang community, which has had an impact in how many schools they can keep open. And that is true. For like, I think five years ago or something like that, a couple of years ago, the North Korean schools were uh, stopped. You know, they, this. They stopped getting money from the government. Like usually, Japanese schools they receive some funding from the government right. so that uh, you don't have to pay for school. Uh, so it's like free education for all. However, North Korean school are now uh, not included in that program, and it's a serious issue. And yeah. when I went two weeks ago to the North Korean school in Tokyo, uh, <clears throat> I saw that they were like you know. Um, uh, raising money, raising funds for the school, uh, you could, you know, give them some money for the for you know for to fund their school as well because it's very expensive from what I heard. My friend told me that's like fifty thousand yen uh, per month for one child to attend a North Korean school. Mm. So that's that's quite yeah. a lot. We did a we uh, NK News. We did a interview last year. I think last summertime with a, a principal at one of the, the North Korean schools in, in Japan. And it seemed that, yeah, there, there were much, much fewer students then during the heyday. And he did explain about some of the, the financial difficulties as well. So echoes what you are saying there. Well, anyway, it's a very interesting topic, you know, the North Koreans in Japan. And I hope that in the West, we can learn a little bit more about them you know, get some more information so that we can show, you know, like stop demonizing them, right? Kind of show their like true, uh, true face of North Koreans living here in Japan and, you know, try to objectively show uh, what does Chonyeon do, right? Yeah, I'm, I, I know our readers are interested in it. So if we are able to, uh, to show a bit more of the, the, their lives and the difficulties that, being experienced in uh, in Tokyo, it'd be it'd be great to do. So yeah. certainly, a uh, subject we'll be hoping to cover more of at NK News. Yeah, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to understand this community a little bit more. You know, for uh, mutual uh, understanding the future, and especially, I think that Japanese should try understanding uh, the North Koreans living here. Well, they've been here for like sixty years now. And I don't think they're moving anywhere. So the best right. way is kind of, you know, try to find mutual, you know, understanding and to at least know a little bit about each other, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, one question though, if you're, um, do you know that if there are Chongyon students, uh, or sorry, Japan, North Koreans in Japan with North Korean passports, do they come in and out of the country with a Japanese permanent residency card? Like, how does that work? Okay, they go from time to time. First of all, uh, North Korean students here in Japan, they can go for trips to North Korea. I'm not sure how often they go, but I've heard from my friends that they went. Like, when they were students, they would go to North Korea for a trip. Uh, some even went for like scholarships, kind of like scholarships, like they could study in North Korea for a while and then come back to Japan. So right. it is really possible. Uh, I'm not sure about, you know, present times, if it's uh, still possible, but I think it is. Some people still go. And I know that some Japanese, North Koreans, they do have North Korean passports. Yeah, yeah. So I, they know can, someone, I know someone in London that had one North Korean passport. Yeah, so, so they can move, you know, in and out of the country uh, pretty freely. Although the North Korean passport is uh, not very useful around the world because it doesn't give you entrance to many countries, but still you can, right, uh, you can go back to North Korea. 
yeah it is also a very interesting topic now I, I would like to know more about that in the future mm -hmm. well um for the last subject you know topic that i would wanted to talk to you about we talked uh just before about tourism in north korea right and uh, let me ask you like a straight question are you against or do you think tourism in north korea is okay what's your opinion I, on that? i think for the most part it's okay um i've been on three trips to north korea myself had I not gone, NK News would not exist. It's that simple. So whenever people, you know, say that tourism is just giving money to the government in North Korea, I always say, well, yeah, that's true to some extent. It's it's a, it's only a small amount in the grand scale of things, but it does sometimes have an effect on the visitors as well as we would hope that the effect that can sometimes be had on people inside North Korea. So maybe I'm an extreme case of setting up a new service based on tourism, but maybe there are other cases similar to mine inside North Korea that result from the impressions North Koreans have had of, on the visiting foreigners as well. That said, I do think that increasingly there are some that go to North Korea maybe for the wrong reasons um and i found it a bit depressing on some of the trips the behavior of some of the people in the group i.e there are you i feel there are some people that treat it like a safari and you know it's all about getting the best picture of the most poor looking north korean and uh, trying to show the real or living conditions as much as possible and and sometimes you think well these these are real people you, you you can fair enough you can take photos of them but some people go a bit too too far with that and you know it's constant like if, if you see the tour bus going along the road uh, it, it genuinely could be like a, a safari vehicle going down a road in a safari park in, in South Africa or something and you know there were there is also a group of people that I feel go just to to build up some very fancy intriguing dinner party conversations for the next few months and um you know that, that's fine I guess but I don't you know I think I think you can I get a lot out when you go to North Korea you're gonna talk about it for a long time my friends know about it very well yeah, that's that's true, for good or for bad. But I think on the on the whole, it's a good good thing. I think if it stopped, it would be uh, a great shame. And uh, you know, I know that some people don't like that perspective, but uh, it's just my view. Last week there was a new airport open in Pyongyang. Mm. So, do you think more tourists will come, as Marshall Kim Jong Un would like? No, maybe not one million, but no, I I think the the numbers of tourists it's nothing to do with how many fancy airports North Korea opens or how many uh, horse riding clubs or uh, outdoor swimming pools or ski resorts or other things that seem to be getting built in North Korea with increasing frequency. It's it's always let's be honest, it's always going to be a kind of political interest thing for most Westerners, at least. Uh, they, I think if you go to North Korea and just get taken around all the best sites, like these brand new uh, construction areas, you know, that's not probably what most people want from their trip. Uh, most people want to be able to interact with local North Koreans and speak to them and um, really have freedom as tourists. And that would probably have a much bigger impact on the, the, the industry if they allowed the kind of freedom you get in Cuba, which is it's, it's still not perfect, but you can, as a visitor in Cuba, you have much, much better freedom than in North Korea. And if you speak Spanish, you can have conversations with locals there quite easily. So I think if that can work in Cuba, why, why can't the Pyongyang government 
relax some of the, the rules a bit and let that kind of autonomous tourism uh, exist. The reason they probably don't is because they seem to be a lot more nervous about information getting in than any other place in, in the world, really. In Cuba, the government, it seems like it can deal with uh, the information that comes in. It doesn't seem to pose a major threat to the leadership there. Whereas the North Koreans, for some reason, seem to think that tour tourists interacting with locals could destabilize the leadership somehow. I can't... I, I'm not entirely sure how, but yeah. Do you think tourism can have positive impact on North Korea? Yeah, I think it can. Um, I don't know if if simply the act of seeing buses with foreign people is, is going to change anything. But one of the things that I think can have an impact is, you know, The, the tour guides themselves, they're speaking and meeting with foreigners all the time. They are then mingling with their own communities of friends and family. And actually through that system, information does get into North Korea. Uh, I remember when I was last there, I think Gaddafi had just been killed. And I actually broke the news to my guide about Gaddafi being you know, killed by his own people. And... I'm sure that would have been shared because it was quite big news at the time. And of course, Gaddafi visited Pyongyang uh, and was an ally of Kim Il Sung while he was still alive. So I think I think tourists can be a source of information into the country. It's just right now uh, there are limited means for that information to get distributed beyond what John Everard calls the Bush Telegraph. You know that friends and family connection. Yeah. Well, my Japanese friend who goes to North Korea almost every year, uh, there are such people, uh, he, he told me that the reason he goes there, he basically saw almost everything you can see as a tourist. The reason he goes is that he really likes his Japanese guides, you know, the Japanese speaking guides. He really, really likes them. He kind of feels bond with them. And they also like him not only because he brings money, But also, you know, they, they just like the interaction and they're like always, oh, when you're going to come back again, please come and bring your friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that that's nice. It would be nicer if the, if the guides could go to Japan and meet him there. Yeah, um, that would be cool. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, tourism is obviously something that, North Korea wants because it does add some legitimacy when you have to the government when you have lots of foreigners visiting a country. Uh, the numbers are woefully low right now. Three three and a half thousand we counted last year that went from Western groups. Chinese haven't actually published any data for a few years now, but I suspect it's got a little bit lower. Uh, Japanese, as you said, is very low, 100 a year. So these are These numbers are, are actually laughable. They, they are so, so small, so minuscule. When you consider 60 million people go to France every year as the number one travel destination in the world, we are really talking about nothing here. Uh, but if tourists could go in very, very high numbers, I think it could have a really, really big impact. And it's, it's, um, it's a shame that it, it can't happen. Yes. The government will get money from from tourists, but as you, if you look at the North Korean economy, it's it's right now a tiny, tiny fraction. And even if you increase in, increased it by a factor of a hundred, it would still be well under like two, three percent of the national GDP, which is really still not that significant. Yeah. I think tourism can have positive impacts, like because like. You give jobs to the people, right? They have something to do, right? The official jobs are often, you know, not really uh, uh, very working very well. But with tourism, you know, people in hotels have jobs, waitresses have jobs, right? The driver has a job, the guide has a job. So you, you do have some positive impact on just ordinary people, right? 
Uh, I think it's a good yeah. thing. Let's hope it doesn't stop completely uh, anytime in the future. And just let me ask you the last thing um, at the end of this uh, interview. Uh, what are your plans for the future with NK News? Or what do you what are you planning? Yeah, well, we are um, we are planning to significantly increase our uh, content uh, portfolio. We really want to start doing a lot more in terms of multimedia video, especially. It's an area we're just starting to look at, uh, which I think has huge potential. Um, we really want to start working with not just defectors, but North Koreans themselves who are working inside Pyongyang. Um, and in that regard, we had some interesting developments earlier this year where uh, with the cooperation of one of the DPRK embassies, uh, we published a piece by the uh, Pyongyang Institute for Disarmament and Peace. Um, and we'll be having more of those kind of articles coming soon. Beyond that, I mean, the, the big vision would really be to have uh, an office in Pyongyang and freedom to report as I would like, not, not necessarily according to the conditions that are on offer right now. I don't know when it's going to be that we can do that, but it would be great to, uh, to have an office there. And beyond all of that, I think if we look into 20 years into the future, it would be great if NK News could become a domestic independent news service that would be broadcasting, uh, or even if just internet based, but broadcasting domestic news from city to city in North Korea. Uh, who knows when that will be, but uh, it would be great, great if we could um, push into that, that kind of area in future. Because I think we are uniquely positioned right now among all media with with just a single focus that um, those things could be possible one day if, if the country evolves in a sufficiently uh, accepting way of, of international media like us. Yeah, that sounds very exciting. Uh, I think we're in a very, very good period right now to report on North Korea. There's so much going on. It's hard to be bored. I'm yeah. always busy with something, really checking on my phone all the time, what's going on. Uh, my wife is very unhappy with that because I um, spend so much time on my North Korean activities, as she calls it. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, it, it can keep you, uh, keep you very busy. But um, right now, yeah, we're, we're mainly, well, we are mainly just bringing information out of North Korea into english-speaking audiences it would be nice to uh to to somehow give information back and i think that the domestic news environment is one of the most interesting ones and who knows when it will be open up for the non-state actors to be involved but it's got to happen at some time mm -hmm. So I hope you, you'll be able to reach your goals uh, with nknews.org and that the site will grow and grow and that you will have even more impact uh, here in Japan as well and in Korea and uh, yes, anywhere in the world. Uh, thank you very much for joining me for the show, even though you're very busy. Uh, thank you very much okay. for that. It was a, a pleasure to talk to you and learn yeah. more about reporting on North Korea. Uh, I'm still a newbie in this uh, subject, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> good stuff. No, it's, it's looking good. And uh, thanks for showing an interest in what we do. And uh, keep up the good work. Yeah, thank you very much. So my, my guest today was uh, uh, Chad O'Carroll from nknews.org. And I'm Emil Truszkowski from pozoroskarlde.com. Greetings from North Korea. And um, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions, just post them on YouTube and maybe afterwards I'll try to answer them or maybe even Chad can, maybe if he has some time, he'll be able to answer your questions on uh, YouTube because you can find this video afterwards uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, so be sure to check it out and uh, be sure to uh, check out nknews.org for more North Korean news as they update their site every day almost every hour so there's always something going on be sure to check it out all right thank you very much thank you very much
Well, right. any, if you have anything to say at the end. So. All right. Uh, just a big, uh, big hello to everybody in Japan that's watching. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope we can, uh, we can, you know, show some of the uh, activities and news related to Japan or Korea relations in the future. It's an in a topic we're very much interested by. And uh, if there's anyone that can help in any way, please get in touch. And uh, yeah, it'd be great. Chad.ocarroll at nknews.org is my email. That's chad.ocarroll at nknews.org. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So um, have a good night. Good night.